Hello everyone and, and welcome at the uh, PSA webinar number five. So this is a session session one of, of, of the uh, fifth presentation and today I'm uh, pleased that uh, Rob Lander uh, agreed to present us uh, his work on uh, diagenesis of uh, clastic rocks and, uh, and possibilities to model and predict uh, diagenesis in, in clastic reservoirs. Rob uh, is interested in controls on diagenetic processes in clastic rocks and uh, using this understanding to develop accurate models of rock properties away from well control and through geologic time. I'm reading this from his LinkedIn profile. And you can see that he worked at uh, Arco for one year and then as a researcher in Exxon, Rogaland, Geologica. And since 2000, uh, he is leading a team uh, and is a co-founder of the Geocosm uh, company. Uh, and uh, uh, also he's working as a research fellow in Jackson School of Geosciences in Austin. And also, uh, I think, in the Bureau of Economic Geology in uh, College Station, Texas, right? No, it's in Austin. Actually. It's in Austin also. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I keep mixing these up. It's, it's been a while since I've gone. <laughs> anyway, anything else you would like to add, Rob, about yourself? No, nope, that's more than enough. All right. So thank you, everybody, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, listen in on this talk. Um, oh, let's see here. Can you see my screen? Okay. I can see it, yes. Um, okay, great. So, so uh, it, this talk is by no means just uh, information by me. I have a tremendous team of people that I get to, get to work with, uh, including uh, Linda Bonnell and uh, Dick Larisse, who, like me, are seminary petrologists. Uh, Jim Gilk, he is a mechanical engineer who has particular expertise in uh, computation methods involving deformation. And then we have what I affectionately call the three geometers down here. These are Daniel Hamilton, uh, Chris Cappadocia, and Alyssa Ross are mathematicians uh, with MeSH Consulting, and they're also associated with the Fields Institute uh, for Math, uh, Mathematics. And they are mathematicians with particular expertise in uh, computational geometry. And then uh, finally, we have uh, Greg Carter, Bill Croteau, and Aaron Brown, who are part of our software development team here at Geocosm. So we have some knowledge of rock properties and subsurface where we have samples uh, at well locations. Um, but how do we predict rock properties away from well control? And an even more difficult question might be, how do we predict what rock properties were in the geologic past? Petroleum systems analysis, that could be important because we want to know something about the capillary properties that might affect migration. Uh, in structural geology, we might want to know something about the geomechanical properties of the rocks during a time of tectonic uh, deformation because that could affect the nature of fractures or faults that might form. So uh, a number of techniques have been used, uh, some perhaps not so successfully. But the approach that we use involves the application of geologic process-oriented models. And like Zhang He, uh, who loves this quote, as I do too, in fact, that was the title of his PSA uh, lecture, there's this great quote from the Wisconsin uh, statistician George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this really is an appropriate sentiment, given that models at best in any discipline are simplified renditions of the real world. But process-oriented models in particular can provide us some deeper insights into the processes that they aim to mimic, um, while also potentially giving us a tool for prediction. The tricky part, of course, is understanding where the inevitable simplifications that we have in a model will materially affect its ability to make accurate predictions. As said so eloquently by Einstein, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Another quote that I've come across in my career working with models, and I bet you, some of you have as well, is uh, by the time you have the input data, you know the answer. It's essentially saying that models don't bring any new information beyond the data that we might use to, to put into them. So I'd like to touch on each of these uh, sentiments about models during the course of the presentation with particular regard to thinking about diagenesis and rocks. 
So we're interested in rock properties. Um, now, this really encompasses a broad range and, and yeah. properties that might be of interest to us. Cross impermeability are obvious ones, but we might also be interested in things like seismic attributes, uh, capillary properties, uh, thermal conductivities, uh, any of a host of properties. Now, these properties are going to reflect a number of things. Uh, environmental conditions, uh, these, some of these properties are sensitive to the temperatures, fluid pressures, and effective stresses that the rocks are seeing. But also, obviously, uh, the composition of the rocks is important. The volumes and properties of the solids, gases, and liquids that comprise the rock will clearly have an important effect on the both properties we're interested in. But beyond that, what's really interesting is that many rock properties also are strongly affected not only by the bulk composition of the rock, but also the topology of the rock, how those, um, prop, how those spaces are distributed in space. Um, that's particularly important, for instance, for controlling permeability, where we might see many orders of magnitude difference in permeability just depending on how we rearrange the components in the rock. So things that affect uh, the phase volumes and the microstructure, well, this would include diagenesis. And by diagenesis, of course, I'm referring to those biological, physical, and chemical processes that are responsible for turning a loose sediment into a rock. Things that affect the magnitude and uh, nature of diagenesis would be the burial history. That's why petroleum systems analysis and basin modeling is so important for understanding diagenesis. So in particular, we want to know something about the temperature and effective stress histories. Uh, in addition, in, in some diagenetic processes, the fluid compositions and fluxes through time can be quite important. And finally, uh, a very important control on diagenesis is the depositional nature of the sand uh, or the sediment. So this, in turn, will reflect the provenance. And by that, I mean uh, the nature of the rocks that are contributing the particles that ultimately end up in the sediment that we're interested in. Also, the transport history, um, how the route that it's taken for that particle once it falls off an outcrop somewhere uh, until it actually ends up being deposited in the final uh, rock that we're interested in. Uh, the depositional environments that those particles have seen along their route, as well, as well as, of course, the final depositional environment. So you can see we have a complex set of interactions if we're trying to understand uh, ultimately rock properties. Now, there's been a lot of work done both in academia and in industry on the depositional part of the problem down here, as well as on the rock properties part of the problem. But what's seen comparatively little attention at least in terms of developing predictive models, is the diagenesis part. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on in the presentation. However, we will come back to discuss the interplay between the same characteristics at deposition, diagenesis, with particular emphasis on the importance of burial history, and how these things, in turn, can affect the spatial distribution of rock properties that we might be interested in. So uh, the model that we use uh, mainly is called a touchstone, and this model includes a number of deterministic diagenetic models. Uh, importantly, this includes compaction and quartz cementation, since these things affect a great many, perhaps almost all, sandstone reservoirs. And in addition, uh, we have uh, incorporated some models that uh, involve the reaction of volcanic rock fragments and feldspars to form various types of clays and zeolites. Now, this list is a lot longer than it was when I started my career which was some years back, uh, but it's by no means comprehensive. And unfortunately, we just don't have at this point um, deterministic models that cover really all aspects of sandstone di diagenesis. And so the approach that we're forced to take uh, in for, for processes that we don't really have to, uh, rigorous models for is sort of an a posteriori type approach. In other words, we need to look at analog samples and look at the occurrence of other diagenetic phases in these analogs. Let's say, for instance, the occurrence of the uh, carbonate uh, calcite. So we would look at the occurrence of calcite in our analog samples. We would also analyze that calcite and try to get a, a handle on when that calcite formed. And then we could use those analog samples as a guide for bringing in that carbonate cement into our, our diagenetic models. Now, these diagenetic models together um, are designed to predict um, 
data that could, is directly comparable to um, thin section petrography type data. And as such, um, these models then can actually serve as input into other rock property type models. So one thing clearly we'd want to be able to get to would be the total porosity. And here we uh, take pains to explicitly look at types of porosity. In particular, we look at the intergranular pores, which tend to be the nice juicy uh, uh, highways for flow inside of the rock. We also look at dissolution pores, which um, tend not to be as well connected and not as effective, and micropores. And micropores are particularly poorly um, are, are not very effective for flow in the rocks. Uh, we also have built in an absolute permeability model that explicitly looks at compositional and textural characteristics of sandstones, a model that gets at the bulk um, uh, density uh, base uh, compositions and chemistry, and then uh, also a published uh, approach that involves um, the incorporation of a number of rock physics models to try and predict, <coughs> excuse me, uh, compressional and shear wave velocities. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the workflow for using this type of a modeling approach. We normally begin with analog wells. And in particular, we would like to get petrographic and core analysis data for some samples. And we also want to know the temperature and effective stress histories for those samples. We can then bring these things into the modeling environment and use parameter optimization uh, methods in an attempt to get a good match between what we observe for the present day and what we simulate for the present day for those samples. Now, if we're successful at doing this, then we have the basis for uh, making some predictions at areas where we don't have samples. So in particular, at prospect locations, for instance, what we would need to do at those prospect locations would be first to identify potential types of sands that we might expect there in terms of their depositional composition and texture. In addition, we need to know something about the temperature and the for those samples. And so that's where, again, basic modeling or petroleum systems analysis would come into play. So we take this data together with the optimized model parameters, and then we can begin to make uh, predictions uh, at, the area of in at the area of interest. And we also have systems that are designed to make predictions over map surfaces, accounting for basis distributions, and uh, to populate patrol earth models. So this ultimately would help, would, would provide some predicted distributions in the reservoir properties that we hope would be a, of use for making predictions both in exploration and in some cases in production. <coughs> All right, so what I'd like to do now is to show you an example uh, of where we use this type of approach to make a pre-drill prediction, and then we'll compare it to the actual results at that well. Now, in this particular case, the uh, operator that we were working with and, and its partners had already decided to, to drill a well. And uh, it was expected to be, at the time, perhaps the most expensive well that had ever been drilled. And so this was a case where every extra day of drilling added tremendously to expense. And so they wanted to ensure that they didn't drill any deeper than necessary, um, go beyond the reservoir quality basement on the one hand, on the other hand, they didn't want to leave uh, pay in the ground untapped. And so uh, in, this, in this case, our objective was to predict the reservoir quality basement. And so we had about 60 samples from a number of wells. Here I'm going to show you the porosities color-coded by well. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show you the absolute porosity values here, but you can see that the porosity is varying quite a bit, and there's no real systematic trend in that porosity with depth. And the temperatures that these samples are reaching is getting up to around 8,200 degrees C, which is where silicate reactions really just start to kick in. And so we were going to be making predictions quite a bit deeper. And so we needed to go beyond a mere statistical analysis of these data and actually use process modeling to try and predict what would be happening in these deeper, higher stress conditions. So our first task in this project was to look at the composition and texture of these sands at the depositional, uh, at the time of deposition, as well as their temperature and effective stress histories, and see if we could reproduce the observed pattern in the porosities. And so here, again, once I, I'm unable to show you the absolute values, but what this is showing is the intergranular portion of the porosity 
on as measured from pet petrographic analysis on the x-axis and what our simulator was predicting on the y-axis for the present day. And these red symbols here, we held out data from one of these wells and we used that as a test. These samples were not used in our parameter optimization procedure. So fortunately, the model was able to reproduce um, this rather broad range of processes. So that gave us some confidence that we could go to the prospect location and make some predictions there that might be useful. So here is the data from the wells. What I'm going to do now, um, after just a moment, is to show you our predictions. But first, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the input data into these predictions. Um, we worked with a, a geoscientist, a really good geoscientist, who unfortunately I'm not allowed to name, uh, a reservoir quality specialist. And what he did was to uh, systematically analyze all the expected stratigraphic units um, as a function of depth at the prospect location. And he determined what the likely depositional compositions and textures would be as a function of depth along the expected well trajectory. Now, in addition, we worked with a very talented petroleum systems uh, modeler, and he was able to uh, provide us a set of temperature and effective stress histories down the expected well trajectory. So we took that together with our, um, our touchstone uh, model parameters and we made this prediction. And so what we're showing here is the predicted P25 to P75 porosity with P50 shown here with this white line. So you can see that what we're predicting really is quite distinct from the data that we use to optimize our model parameters. So I would argue here that the model results were not self-evident simply by looking at the input data that we put into the model. The model itself brings some additional information. Now it remains to be seen at this point whether that additional information in fact, it is a closer representation of the actual porosity of the well. We'll get into that in, in a moment. But I just wanted to point out before I bring on the well data that um, it's a rather unusual dog leg type form to this porosity decline with depth. We can see uh, in the upper regions here that there's not much in the way of kind of it's a re relatively slow rate of porosity loss up until about <laughs> five and a half kilometers burial depth. But then we see a rather abrupt rapid decline in the porosity with depth. All right, so now let's come to the evaluation of the results after we have made these predictions. So this is a lot of porosity data from the well with a rather high V-shale cutoff. And the operator, fortunately, was quite pleased with our results because uh, they felt that it did give them a very uh, reasonable basis for predicting, for knowing what the reservoir quality basin was. We also were quite happy because it did predict this rather weird uh, dog leg shape to the porosity decline with depth. Moreover, we had rotary sidewall cores from throughout this interval, and we were able to demonstrate that the model uh, made the correct porosity predictions for the right reasons, namely that it correctly predicted the magnitude of porosity loss due to compaction as opposed to cementation. So I hope this gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, how a practical application for this type of model. What I'd like to do now is to delve a little bit deeper into the processes that actually occur in sandstones that are responsible for uh, controlling the reservoir quality degradation through geologic time. So let's begin with compaction, since that affects virtually every sandstone reservoir. And what I'm going to do now is to show you some experimental work that uh, we did, trying to get a handle on the effect of both uh, effective stress and the composition of the sand on controlling the the compaction response. And so this is an experiment where we had about three quarters of the grains made up of natural quartz grains, those are these well-rounded white grains here. And the remaining, the remaining grains were evenly divided between these shale rock fragments and these angular feldspar grains. Now this is a thin section of the pack that, of a pack that we made in the lab and we, that we subjected to very low effective stress, just about three megapascals. Now we took an equivalent pack to this one and we put it under much higher effective stress and as you'd expect, uh, we went from this initial porosity here, you can see the blue dot epoxy of about 40% down to about 27% uh, when we raised the effective stress to about 52 megapascals. Now this would be equivalent to about a little bit over four kilometers of burial under hydrostatic fluid uh, conditions. And I should say that this um, uh, intergranular porosity here is quite consistent with what we observe in nature for sandstones with this type of composition and texture. 
Now it's interesting to look at the nature of the deformation in this uh, thin section. Notice that the shale rock fragments have deformed plastically so that we have a large area of contact between them and the adjacent rigid grains. Um, the feldspars have shattered in many cases here. And we see that the quartz grains have um, developed fractures at these small areas of contact um, between them. All right, so with this in mind now, let's do another experiment. We're going to work with two of these three components, the shale rock fragments and the quartz grains. But in this case, we're going to have them present in equal abundances, as you can see over here on the right. Now, under very low effective stress, it actually has slightly higher porosity, about 43%, compared to the rigid grain equivalent over here on the left. So we put this under um, 52 megapascals effective stress. And not surprisingly, we saw quite um, a higher degree of compaction, down to about 13% intergranular porosity here. Now, not surprisingly, uh, we've seen a lot of plastic deformation of these shale rock fragments to the point, actually, where it's actually a little bit difficult to see the boundaries between these individual shale rock fragments down here. They've just kind of mushed together. And what's interesting to me, too, in looking at this is looking at the difference in the quartz grain deformation. Notice that although we actually have less bulk compaction over here on the left, we have more in the way of rigid fracturing the quartz grains compared to over here on the right. So why is that? Uh, well, even though we're imposing the same effective stress in this experiment, what's happening is that the shale rock fragments are deforming around these quartz grains, and that distributes the stress over a broader area of the grain. So even where we have quartz on quartz contacts, the stress concentration of those contacts is a lot less than over here on the left, where much of the stress um, through this grain pack is being distributed through very small areas of contact. And so what's happened here is that the high contact stress here was sufficiently high that we actually exceeded the yield strength of the quartz and we broke that quartz. Now this may look to you like something that doesn't look very realistic geologically, but what we found is that when you look at sandstones like this from nature in cathodal luminescence imaging, they indeed oftentimes show this type of fracturing. It's just not apparent when you look at it in an optical thin section or optical microscope because these fractures quickly fill in with quartz overgrowth cement and very, are very difficult to see without the aid of cathodal luminescence. So in thinking about modeling this, what we've found through a lot of experiments, um, in particular that Dick Larice, my colleague, has done, is that there's a strongly nonlinear uh, effect of the compaction magnitude both to the volume of ductile components in the rock and their mechanical properties, such that the more mechanically weak they are, the more strongly nonlinear the compaction effect is. And so we built models that try to account for that uh, compositional effect and rock property effect into our system. So let's talk about quartz cementation now. In my view, um, one of the most important breakthroughs in all of sedimentary geology actually was done, uh, come up with by my old colleague, Ulav Alderhoff. Ulav cracked the quartz cement problem, which had been something that people have been working on for 100 years. There have been countless PhD theses, countless industry uh, research programs, but Prior to his groundbreaking work, no one had come up with a general model that could actually reproduce observed quartz cement abundances in sandstones. This was an amazing accomplishment. Now, prior to his work, what people focused on primarily in trying to understand the spatial distribution of quartz was either the supply problem or the transport problem. The supply problem would be trying to track down where does that dissolve silica, which grows as overgrowth, like this one over here, where did it come from? Um, there are a number of potential sources, of course, things like cementite ultization, uh, albedization of plagioclase or K feldspar, mainly plagioclase, um, and dissolution of quartz grains at, at, at stress contacts, for instance. The other problem that people have focused on quite a bit is um, the transport mechanisms that would take that dissolved silica from where it came into solution to where it would ultimately precipitate out as an overgrowth. Um, people looked a lot at advection, that is the movement of fluids, um, silica-bearing fluids, or molecular diffusion. Now what Ulov realized in doing an ex 
uh, exhaustive fluid inclusion uh, uh, analysis of quartz overgrowth and also doing invasive modeling to get temperature histories was that the rate at which these quartz crystals grow in the subsurface is incredibly slow. Moreover, we know from uh, countless uh, fluid composition analyses of reservoirs that fluid compositions are almost always right at where we expect them to be with respect to super, er, saturation with respect to quartz. So he re reasoned that the rate of quartz growth will be very slow compared to the rate at which we are supplying silica into the system and then transporting it. And therefore, we have the potential that, at least in many situations, what would be the rate controlling factor in quartz growth will be the rate at which the crystals themselves could grow. And if that's the case then, uh, the two primary things that would control the overall rate of quartz growth in the rock would be the surface area for overgrowth nucleation and the temperature history. Now let's consider the surface area here first. Now you can see from this image, this is a cross-polarized eye image, that quartz overgrowth in fact are the same crystal as the underlying detrital quartz grain. So when the overgrowth nucleates and begins to grow, it actually needs to have a pre-existing quartz crystal for that dissolved silica to nucleate on and to, for that crystal con to continue to grow. And so things that will affect the amount of surface area that's available for quartz overgrowth to form would include, of course, the proportion of the rock that's made up of quartz grains, the grain size, um, smaller grains have higher surface areas per volume compared to larger grains. And also very importantly, um, the occurrence of very thin coatings on the surfaces of grains, for instance, of the mineral chloride, or actually of many different types of substances, can also reduce the nucleation surface area and, and have a big impact on quartz cementation rates. Now the other factor here is the temperature history. And uh, what we've found is that um, we can use our old friend, the Rainis equation, to quite uh, nicely depict the temperature dependence and the rate of crystal growth um, in quartz. So with this in mind, let's take a look at the performance of um, this type of modeling approach on two, two very carefully collected data sets. Now we're going to look at data from Jurassic Age sandstones uh, from a rift basin from offshore mid-Norway on the left. And on the right, we're going to look at Miocene age sandstones from offshore Southeast Asia that have been exposed to ex extremely high temperature gradients. Now, in both of these plots, we're going to look at the amount of quartz cement that was measured by thin section photography on x-axis and what we simulate um, for the present day on the y-axis. And this black envelope here represents essentially the measurement uncertainty uh, for quartz cement abundance. And so you can see here that in, in both of these large data sets, actually the model is doing a very good job at reproducing the quartz cement, the observed quartz cement abundances uh, in these sandstones. So my colleague Linda Bonnell, however, was not satisfied with this performance. She, particularly for the RIP data set, she wanted to see whether there was any systematic error in these models that could help us to improve them. And so she went through these data sets and many other data sets in great detail. And she indeed discovered that there was a very systematic error that, that she observed in virtually every data set that she looked at. And to reveal that error, what I'm going to do now is strip away all the points in these plots with the exception of the grain size extremes. And so here, what you can see in both of these data sets is that we tend to overpredict we're predicting too much quartz cement in the fine grain rocks while predicting too little quartz cement in the very coarse grain rocks. Now, I'm sure some of you are already thinking about hypotheses that could explain this. And one of the ones that came to, to us right away and might have come to you is that maybe the silica supply uh, assumption is wrong. Perhaps uh, because these fine grain rocks have lower permeabilities, actually we weren't able to supply silica as rapidly as we could, for instance, these very coarse grain rocks. And that's a, certainly a very uh, valid assumption or valid hypothesis to test. However, we had some other lines of evidence uh, to suggest that actually what might be going on is that the rate of growth per unit surface area, for some reason, is actually slower in these finer grain rocks compared to these uh, very coarse grain rocks. And so we set up a laboratory experiment to test that hypothesis. 
And so what we did was we took a single quartz prism like this one, and we sliced it perpendicular to the C crystallographic axis, which would be the long axis of the prism. Now onto this surface, we place a copper foil. And into that copper foil, we cut a series of holes over a size range that would include and extend beyond what we would expect for a sand grain. And so we then put this into a hydrothermal reactor that was super saturated with respect to quartz. And we grew a bunch of little overgrowths through those holes. And so uh, the neat thing about this experiment was that we had so many controls. We were growing overgrowths on the same seed crystal. These overgrowths were growing from the same um, temperature and compositions of fluids. And uh, really, the only thing that we were varying was the size of the nu nucleation domain. And so to take a look at this, this is an SEM photomicrograph, We're kind of looking down on the top of this quartz plate here. These little guys here are overgrowths that have begun to grow through this copper foil. And so if our hypothesis was correct, what we would have expected to see is if we looked edge onto this plate after a lot of time in the reactor, that the overgrowth that grew on this large hole should have grown further away from this plate compared to these overgrowths growing on the small holes. So let's see what happened. So here we're looking edge on, and we can see that indeed, when we look at this large diameter hole here, this crystal grew considerably further away from the plate compared to this small one, which grew on a small diameter hole. So this seemed to confirm our what we suspected from looking at the natural data sets. Now we have to, of course, answer why. Why did that happen? To address that, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the growth history of this big guy, one of these little guys, and an intermediate one. So in this plot, what we're going to do, um, Dick Larisse, who did these experiments, uh, what he did was every two days, he broke the experimental apparatus down, and he measured the length of those crystals. And so uh, the length, their lengths uh, away or along that C crystallographic axis. So let's begin by looking at the growth history for this large crystal here. And you can see that over this period in the reactor, it grew at a linear rate. All right, now let's take a look at the growth history of the smaller crystal. Interestingly, it grew at the same rate as this larger crystal through 144 hours in the reactor. After this, though, we see a precipitous drop in the precipitation rate, about a factor of 20. So interestingly, so we were growing at the same rate as a larger crystal for a while, but then all of a sudden the rate dropped off such that at the end of the experiment, our net rate was a lot slower. Interesting. All right, so now let's take a look at the growth on an even smaller crystal or smaller domain. So it also grew at the same rate in the first 48 hours. However, it then went through this transition. And once it went through this transition, the rate of growth in this regime was the same as the rate of growth within this regime on this larger crystal within measurement uncertainty. The only difference here seemed to be the fact that we went through this transition at an earlier point in growth on this smaller domain. So we have two questions that we need to answer here. One is why do we see this, this transition in the growth rate? The next question we have to deal with is why is this transition a function of the size of the nucleation domain? So let's deal with the first question first. And I think this is going to be immediately obvious to you when I show you SEM photomicrographs of this growing crystal. So what you can see here is that this inflection point represents the point where the quartz overgrowth first achieves a fully euhedral form. When we are in this fast rate of growth here, notice we have this really uh, irregular sort of warty looking surface on the top of the crystal where we have on the other hand we have these beautiful euhedral faces that are growing along the sides of the crystal. So what's going on here? Well this surface which is perpendicular to the C crystallographic axis in fact does not correspond to a euhedral quartz face. And so what's happening here is when we look at the atomic structure on the edge of the crystal we have a very high density of unsatisfied atomic bonds in this particular orientation. Each one of those bonds wants desperately to satisfy its, its charge imbalance. So any times 
a dissolved silica molecule happens to be floating around, it wants to grab that dissolved silica mo molecule to satisfy its charge, and that grows the crystal rapidly. So on the other hand, on these euhedral faces, these faces represent minima in terms of the density of unsatisfied atomic bonds. So although a given atomic, a given um, unsatisfied bond here would be growing at the same rate as one here, because we have so many, such a higher density here, we grow the crystal faster. And so this is what's controlling really the rate of, of the difference in the rate of growth along the c-axis on this type of surface compared to these pyramidal faces on the quartz crystal. Okay, so we've answered one question, which is what is the cause of this transition? And that is that this transition represents a case where we no longer have this fast non-euhedral surface type to grow the quartz on. All right, now let's come to the question about why is this transition a function of the size of the crystal domain? And to address that, what we're going to do is look at a simple um, uh, simulation with our PRISM 2D model. Uh, these are circular cross-section uh, grains, and I've lined them up so that their top edges are all at the same horizontal position, and these guys all have their C crystallographic axes oriented vertically. And so the colors here represent different rates of growth on different types of nucleation surfaces, with the red representing growth on non euhedral C-axis surfaces, the green on pyramidal faces of the quartz crystal, and the cyan here, which is even slower growing, which would be growth on the prismatic faces of the quartz crystal. And what you can see here is that the model is reproducing the fact that we grew less far along the smaller diameter grain here compared to this larger diameter grain. So why is that? Okay, well, let's take a look at, um, let's see if I can get this to cooperate here. Let's go back in time and look right here. And this is the time where this small diameter crystal achieved a euhedral form. Notice that these euhedral faces all have the same orientation irrespective of the size of the crystal. And because of the smaller area, um, we're growing this smaller area here, we achieve that euhedral termination with less distance along the c-axis, the small crystal, compared to this big one. And so the effect here is, is that we have no surfaces anymore where we're growing rapidly on non-euhedral surfaces for this grain. On the other hand, this larger grain, we have this entire surface right here that is growing at a fast rate. And so the net rate of growth here, the average rate of growth, is going to be faster per unit surface area on this larger grain compared to the smaller one. So I hope that makes sense for why that would be the case. So now, after uh, breaking down the model performance, seeing where it was, where there's a systematic error, by doing some experiments to understand the nature, the cause of that error, we now have some new understanding. And the question is whether, by having that new understanding, can we improve the predictive accuracy of our models? So just to remind you where we were, this is what the results look like when we assume that the rate of growth per unit surface area is independent of the size of the grains uh, that the quartz is, is growing on. It's uniform over all the grains. So here's a model where, where we use a rate law that takes into account this different net rate of growth depending on the size of the nucleation domain. I hope you can see that that tightened up these results quite a bit. And it, we found that in every case that we looked at, where we had a broad range in, in mean grain sizes, we saw a distinct measurable improvement in our model predictive accuracy. So what that means is that in addition to these uh, important insights that Balderhog had about the controls on quartz imitation, we can add a, a third factor, and that's the size of the crystal domain. And if you're interested in this, we have a paper in uh, 2008 in APG Bolton that goes into this in more detail. What's neat, actually, is in this this thin section of photomicrograph, in fact, shows that very effect that we were talking about. Take a look at this grain right here in the lower left. This has, is a single quartz crystal domain. It has its C-axis pointing out into the pore space, and we have quite a thick quartz overgrowth here. Now take a look at this polycrystalline grain. We have one small quartz crystal domain right here. It also has its C-axis pointing out into the pore space, but notice it has this euhedral form and has grown much less, even though obviously the same, we had the same pore fluid and same temperature conditions across the span of this pore. So this is a, 
and the fact that we can readily observe in nature. All right, so I hope that um, these things give you a little bit of a sense of some of the processes that take place in sandstones and how we think about modeling these processes. What I'd like to do now is to come back to this notion that there's an interesting interdependency between the sedimentology of the system, the burial history, diagenesis, and spatial distribution of rock properties, and temporal distribution of rock properties. And to illustrate that, we're going to consider a schematic of a submarine fan. And we've broken this fan into four facies. We've got a channel facies that's grading into an inner lobe, middle lobe, and outer lobe. Now, due to the hydrodynamic sorting effects, as we progress from the channel to the outer lobe, we see some uh, minor changes in the mean grain size. We also see a tendency for a greater concentration of shale rock fragments out here in the outer part of the lobe. And very importantly, as we'll see, we also see uh, greater admixtures of detrital clay in the system as we get outboard into the submarine fan. So that's our depositional starting point. Let's think about now the impact of burial history on the starting point. To address that, we're going to take our two pancake uh, submarine fans here, and I had a 3D basin model to work with, and I just took one and put it in a younger stratigraphic position, stratigraphic horizon or interval, and then um, repeated it in a deeper one so that we would have a temperature history difference. And so here are points from the centers of these fans, and you can see the difference in the geologic age and the fact that we have a higher temperature throughout the geologic time as you'd expect in the deeper fan. And of course, there's also a corresponding effect of stress difference between these two fans. So let's now take a look at how the impact of the depositional characteristics and these burial history characteristics, uh, what they had on the total porosity that we predict in these two submarine fans. So on the left is our shallower fan, and on the right, our deeper fan. Now, not surprisingly, our deeper fan, which has been subjected to higher temperatures and effective stresses, has a lower range in, in total porosities compared to its shallower doppelganger here. What I find to be very interesting in looking at these two fans is a contrast in the porosity between the facies. Now, if we look at this part of the fan right here, where we have a close juxtaposition between the channel and the outer lobe, we see that there's quite a large porosity difference between these two facies. Interestingly, and perhaps not intuitively, we actually see higher predicted porosities in the outer lobe compared to this, what you would expect to be a better reservoir quality facies in the channel. Now, if we look at the shallow, same, the equivalent area in the shallow fan, we see actually about the same total porosity between these two facies. So what we can glean from this is that the relative difference in reservoir quality between different facies is not necessarily constant through geologic time. It could be very dependent on the burial history. So to get a better handle on what's going on here, let's do this. We're going to take a burial history from the center of this fan, and we're going to subject all four of these facies to that exact same burial history and see how it responds through geologic time. So just to remind you, here's what that temperature history looks like. And of course, there's an effective stress history to go along with this. But now let's look at the total porosity through geologic time for those four facies. And so what we see is that shortly after burial, we had a very rapid pulse of burial. Um, that had a correspondingly rapid increase in effective stress. And so shortly after burial, we had a very rapid porosity loss that was driven by mechanical compaction. Now, interestingly, at this point in the barrel history, we're actually predicting lower total porosities in the outer lobe here compared to the channel. And the reason for this is that we have a bit more of those ductile shale rock fragments mixed in here, and we also have some detrital clay. And that detrital clay, although it is microporous, is partly filling in intergranular pores. So the solid part of those clay particles, in fact, is reducing the porosity compared to what it would otherwise be if we didn't have that detrital clay in the system. Now, through time, what we see is that we have this general decline in total porosity for all the facies, but eventually there's a crossover point where the rate of porosity loss here in the outer lobe is quite a bit less than in these other facies. 
Now this occurred about 40 million years ago, and we can see that the temperature at that time was roughly 100 degrees C, which is just when silicate reactions began to take place. So as you might have guessed, uh, most of the processing loss in this part of the barrel history is resulting from quartz cementation. So let's take a look at the quartz cement results for these bases. So we see that indeed um, the reason that we are having that slower rate of frosty loss in the outer lobe compared to the channel is that the rate of quartz cementation is, is different there, despite the fact that we have exactly the same temperature history in this particular setup here. So why do we see less quartz cement in the outer lobe compared to the channel? Well, it comes back to that effect of the detrital clay that we were talking about before. Now, in the channel, we have very little in the way of that detrital clay. And so we have nice, big, juicy, intergranular pores. So when the quartz overgrowths nucleate on the, on the pore walls, on these quartz grains, those overgrowths can grow over the entire extent of nucleation domains, and therefore they can grow at a fast, non euhedral rate into that pore space. On the other hand, if we think about the outer lobe here, we have a lot of de microporous detrital clay in the system. Some of that detrital clay is actually sitting on the surface of the quartz grains, and that's reducing the surface area for nucleation. The additional effect that that microporous uh, clay has is that it creates tiny little surface areas, independent surface areas, on the scale of microns. And so what's happening is, is that even though quartz might nucleate on these uh, little pores between the detrital clay particles, the areas of those surface area, the, the areas of those surfaces are really small, and so they quickly grow euhedral faces. And so the quartz growth rate invading into those micropores is extremely slow. And so in a sense, um, those micropores were preferentially preserving the prosody in those micropores compared to the intergranular pores. So let's now consider not just total prosody, but actually just the intergranular portion of the prosody in these species which is the key porosity to be thinking about in terms of reservoir quality. And here we see a different picture than what we saw from the total porosity. We see that in, throughout the geologic history, the channel actually has higher intergranular porosity compared to the outer lobe. And we see that it's quite a large difference in intergranular porosity through much of the geologic time. Although, over this period of where quartz cementation has kicked in, that difference has narrowed considerably such that there's not a strong difference at the present day. So the interesting thing to think about here is if you're looking at analog samples and you have analogs that have very high thermal exposures, the relative difference between species that you observe may not be a very good guide for what they were, that difference was in the geologic past or what that difference might be if you looked at the same um, composition and texture rocks that had been exposed to a lower thermal or had lower thermal exposure. So anyway, I hope this gives you a feeling for why we're seeing differences between these two pans and how they evolve through time. Now let's go on and consider the spatial distribution of rock properties. So here is our predicted geometric mean permeability um, for these two fans. And as you might expect, by looking at those differences in the intergranular porosity through time, what we see is that in the deeper fan, where we have a greater extent of diagenetic alteration, the range in the geometric mean permeabilities between the channel and the uh, outer lobe are pretty, pretty small. On the other hand, if we looked at that equivalent position here in the shallower fan, we're seeing uh, over two order magnitude difference in the geometric mean permeability. So what I hope all you petroleum systems analysts see from this and base modelers is see just how important um, your work is for understanding diagenesis. Barrel history is central for understanding um, the impact of diagenetic alteration. And if we can put that barrel history perspective together with a sedimentological understanding and diagenesis understanding, this gives us the potential to do a better job of predicting the spatial variations and rock properties that we might be interested in, not only at the present day, but also through geologic time. So what I've talked about up till now represents really where we are with respect to the state of the art and our abilities now to predict sandstone reservoir properties. What I thought you might be interested in seeing is a, a glimpse, a very early glimpse, into our efforts to build a, a new generation reservoir quality model that uses a fundament, fundamentally different approach towards modeling diagenesis. 
And for this, uh, I, I love this quote from Victor Hugo, how do we know that the creations of worlds are not determined by falling grains of sand in Les Miserables? And in fact, uh, this new system, which we call Cyberstone, uh, in fact begins by creating a virtual world by simulating um, the deposition of the sand grains. And so you can see here that we're using very realistic sand geometry, grain geometries that are derived from micro CT scans. And we also are rigorously simulating the physics of grain deposition. And so our objective here is to have an initial geometry after the depositional step that will be a, a, a accurate depiction of the spatial distribution of grains and pores that would serve as a basis for our digenesis simulations. And so I just finished rendering this about uh, 10 o'clock last night. But this is a, uh, shows one of our depositional simulations of a moderately well-sorted sand. And we actually have a physical grain pack uh, that we made in the lab that corresponds precisely to the same um, origin sand grains. And we found that our depositional um, porosity in the sand pack is within uh, two volume percent of what we observe in the, in the lab. So this means that we think we are getting a reasonable starting point for our digenesis simulations. So what I'm going to do now is to show you some of our uh, early attempts to model the compaction of these sort of packs. And this is where my colleague Jim uh, Gilkey, who is a mechanical engineer, has been central in uh, helping us to, um, to accurately simulate mechanical compaction. So what we're going to look at here are two provisional or two kind of small scale uh, compaction simulations that are designed to be similar to those thin section photomicrographs I showed you at the laboratory experiments that uh, my buddy Dick Larice did. And um, so on the left here, the yellow grains uh, represent the quartz grains. Uh, that's true on both sides. And the red grains represent uh, more ductile shale rock fragments. So we're going to stress these packs up to 52 megapascals, just like we did in the lab experiment. And so you can see that we are getting a lot of plastic deformation of these shale rock fragments, and we are correctly predicting that we're getting a greater magnitude of compaction for the same effect of stress when we have this higher volume of, of uh, the more ductile components. And just to give you some more insights into these simulation results, here we're going to look at the plastic strain at the end of the simulation for these uh, two simulations. And the red here, not surprisingly, are the shale rock fragments that have undergone tremendous uh, deformation. But you can also see that for the quartz grains, um, you can see the little red symbols. There's also a little bit of plastic deformation at the contacts between these quartz grains. Uh, and this is also very important to think about in terms of uh, understanding the rock physics of these uh, types of packs. And here I just uh, thought you might like to see some of the grains in the interior of these two packs. You can clearly see, and, and here what we're looking at is the von Mises equivalent stress on the outer surfaces of these grains. Notice that the shale rock fragments don't show much stress. They're kind of the California, California surfer dudes of grains. They just go with the flow. They don't get very stressed up, but they deform tremendously. But on the other hand, the quartz grains do get quite stressed. And so here, just looking at that ridge grain rich pack, we have the stress on the surfaces of the grains on the left and the plastic strain on the right, um, these dark red symbols show very nicely where the contacts are between these grains. And we can also over see over here what the stresses look like on these grains, which again, as I mentioned, will be very important for trying to get at rock physics behavior uh, in sandstones. So I'll, what I'd like to do now is to show you our uh, early efforts at building a 3D quartz cement model. And this has proven to be quite a significant challenge. And this is where, in particular, my colleague Alyssa Ross, as well as Daniel Hamilton and Chris Cappadocia have been central to developing a, a model of this process. So what we're going to look at here is a uh, micro CT scan of a natural sand grain. And we're going to grow a quartz overgrowth onion. And I think you can see the pyramidal faces uh, forming on this quartz overgrowth as well as these prismatic bases. And one of the things that we wanted to strive for was the ability to simulate a quartz overgrowth on any irregular sort of shape. And just to illustrate that, uh, we're going to crystallize a, a bunny here. So we're going a, a quartz overgrowth on 
the uh, Stanford Rabbit, which is used for a lot of graphics simulations. So you can see that it's quite a robust algorithm. So we've tested this model against our experimental work. And what this is showing is a plot similar to what I showed you before, where we looked at the, the history of crystal growth in those quartz experiments. These points represent um, data from the experiments, and the solid lines show our simulation results. So you, I think you can see that the model is doing a very good job of getting this, this quartz growth rate effect as a function of the development of the euhedral bases uh, on this, on these, uh, as a function of the area of nucleation. So another thing that we are very concerned about in simulating quartz cement is that we accurately depict the area of contact that develops between the overgrowth and other solids, because this has a big impact, again, on the rock physics. And so to illustrate that, uh, we start off with some spherical grains here. And you can see um, the boundaries that are beginning to develop between these grains. So we wanted to ensure that we are accurately depicting the area and geometry of these contacts because of the important effect that this has on the rock physics behavior as well as on the mechanical, geomechanical behavior of the sandstone. Now obviously we want to work with more realistic packs than just spheres. Now unfortunately we don't have all of our pieces hooked together yet, so we, I wasn't able to uh, compact this particular grain pack before growing quartz cement, which obviously is something we, we need to do to make this geologically reasonable. Another limitation of the simulation I'm going to show you is it's assuming that quartz is growing on all grains, which of course is not the case. Nonetheless, it's a proof of concept that I think will give you a sense of where we're trying to go with this quartz uh, modeling. So what we're looking at here on the left is a slice of cake through our 3D grain pack. And on the right is a 2D slice from that 3D grain pack, where obviously the blue here represents pore space and the yellow represents quartz grains. And now what we're going to do is to progressively cement up this pack with quartz cement, shown here in orange. And so you can see um, what we are very satisfied with is that the geometry between um, of contacts between these uh, overgrowths is very reminiscent of what we see in nature. We often see these sort of triple junctions in quartz overgrowths and, and pores. And also the geometry of the pores themselves is also quite uh, reminiscent of what we see in uh, very highly quartz cemented quartz aronites. So just going back to the um, contact uh, part of the problem, here again, uh, same grain pack, but what I've done over here is to make the grains pretty transparent. And I'm going to show you, visualize just the contacts that develop between the grains as a function of quartz cement. And on the right, we also are going to look at that, but just kind of through a thin slice in the 3D volume. So these things that look sort of like potato chips uh, over here are the contact surfaces. Uh, these are kind of a toast slice-like view of those contact surfaces. And so we can see how they grow as a function of the quartz cement growth. So um, again, this will be very is uh, as a proof of concept, is to show how we can take the results of these types of simulations and then use them in uh, so-called digital rock physics models that have been developed to try and predict rock properties from micro CT scans of natural sandstones. In this case, however, we're going to use simulated um, core geometries through geologic time. And so what we're looking at here is uh, that same 3D grain pack. On the right, uh, this thing that looks like Swiss blue Swiss cheese is a rendering of the pore volume as if the pore volume were solid. So these pock marks here represent where we have the quartz grains. Now the spaghetti over here on the left uh, is the result of a flow simulation where we're flowing fluids from the bottom of our, our pore space to the top. And so you can see that the spaghetti in this case is nearly vertical, and that's because we have very low flow path tortuosity. These are the streamlines from our flow simulation. So when we have no quartz cement here, we're getting about seven Darcy's uh, permeability. Let's see what happens to the pore space, the tortuosity, and the permeability as we progressively fill in these pores with quartz cement. So here, now we've got about half of the pore space filled in with quartz cement. Notice our spaghetti is getting much more tortuous, and we've dropped our permeability by about a factor of, uh, about an order of magnitude. We'll put in some more quartz cement. 
Now we're down to about 130 millidarcies, much more tortuous pore space. And then here at this point, we're down uh, three orders of magnitude from where we started. We have a very discontinuous pore space. And by the way, here I'm only rendering the connected part of the pore space that continuously goes from the bottom of the simulated volume to the top of the volume. So I hope that this gives you a sense of where we're trying to go. Obviously, we have some work to do to uh, couple these pieces together and to do this on geologically um, realistic depictions of the co initial composition and texture. But I hope it at least gives you a visual idea of what, what we're trying to accomplish. So here we are. We're at the end of the talk, and it's time to come back to these quotes about models. By the time you have the input data, you know the answer. I hope with our pre dual prediction example here that I could convince you that models actually bring important new information to the table beyond just the data that go into these models, at least successful models do. All models are wrong, but some are useful. We saw that Balderhog's groundbreaking ideas led to an unprecedented ability to, to accurately um, reproduce observed quartz cement abundances in the subsurface. However, in looking at this in detail, we discovered that this model wasn't considering one, one factor, which is the size of the crystal domain and how that would impact the rates of quartz growth. And when we made our model a little bit less simple, we improved its predictive accuracy. And we're also hoping that uh, with our Cyberstone model, by much more rigorously simulating some of the mechanical and chemical processes that take place in these rocks, and, and by generating uh, explicit three-dimensional representations of the geometry of the pores and the solids that we will be able to do improve our, our models even more and also very importantly we'll be able to link these models with uh, the incredible work that's been going on in the digital rock physics realm to predict a host of rock properties from the microstructure of, of sediments. So uh, I hope you can see that from this that we believe in an evolutionary approach towards building models. We start with some simple concepts we build predictive models and then rigorously test them against natural data sets and experiments. We then find out where the models go wrong. And that's enormously useful because it allows us to focus our efforts on the things that really matter for what we're trying to predict, as opposed to the myriad other things that might be important, but we're not sure that they're important. And so uh, with that, I'd like to thank our uh, consortium for the quantitative prediction of science on reservoir quality who's been supporting our research and development over the last 16 years. I'm very grateful to these companies that are our current supporters. I'd also like to thank David for asking me to give this talk and very importantly to all of you for taking time, time out of your busy schedules uh, to attend the talk. So I'd be glad to address any questions or comments that you might have at this point about the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Rob. This, uh... This was fantastic. Uh, one hour passed like a breeze. <laughs> it's great, great review. Um, yeah, I was wondering. So, how how do you envision um, uh, coupling this more advanced model with with, with a basin model? Well, we still need the the temperature and effective stress history. Um, <clears throat> as input into that into that mm -hmm. simulator so we are, we're using similar rate equations to what we would use in our touchstone system for instance for the quartz cement rate um, and we need the effective stresses uh, you know for these compaction uh, simulations for instance uh, I didn't say this explicitly but um, these particular uh, uh, simulations what we have we, we have these grains inside of the hollowed out container and in the top of that container, we have a, a big piston. And we apply an effective stress on that piston that would be derived from a base of models um, mm -hmm. uh, prediction of the effective stress. Mm -hmm. But basically, uh, uh, it, it would be a, a similar connection like, like the current touchstone thing, uh, where you, you use the output from, uh, from base and model, the, the burial history, and then you somehow parameterize the behavior of, of the rock on average, and then you sort of trans well, in this case, apply, apply the, the uh, generalized behavior of the rock uh, on a map or, or, or volume of, of uh, the 
reservoir in, in the basin model. So I, I presume we're not going to, to calculate uh, all this detail on, on every cell in, in a basin model, correct? No, no. In fact, uh, unfortunately, we're, right now we're looking at supercomputers for actually doing simulations on large packs. Um, these, right. these particular simulations right here, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, took about four days on a, you know, a fairly high-end um, workstation. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, we'd like to be able to do simulations uh, involving thousands of grains. These particular simulations are about 200. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, but you know, I, I guess you know today's supercomputer is tomorrow's smartphone. So <laughs> we're hopeful that uh, you know that the computing power will catch up to the point where we can we can do this. So we don't really see uh, for the foreseeable future this type of modeling supplanting what we would do in Touchstone, for instance. Um, uh, 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 we think that they both have uh, certain uses, but if you really want to do it, let's say you want to do a relative permeability simulation, um, where let's say you're, you're in a case where you're trying to decide how to produce a field, and you have some samples from the top of the structure, but you're not sure what the rocks are going to look like down structure, where you have higher effective stresses and temperatures. Well, with this Cyberstone method, you could take a sample from the top, um, reproduce that um, with the simulations, and then you could say, well, what if it had been exposed to higher stresses and, and temperatures at the flank of the structure, and what would that, how would that affect the relative permeability, for instance? So you could do, a, say, a lattice Boltzmann type mm -hmm. um, multi fluid simulation. So that, that's where we see the, the potential utility of, of uh -huh. this type of model. Okay. okay. Yeah, so uh, I see uh, some comments in the chat window. Can you can you read them also? Yeah. Uh, okay, there, there are no questions actually uh, that I see. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, I think the comments all look pretty good to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I would be happy. Thank you all very much for the nice comments. Yeah. Um, any questions from, from anybody else? Uh, I mean, feel free to use the microphones uh, or, or type it in the chat window. Hmm. Ah. Well, do you, you want to add? Ask your question there. Oh, two minutes. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to say the, the same thing I, I'm seeing in the comments. It, it was a fantastically clear presentation of, of this topic, condensed in, a, in, in such an easy flow of, of graphics and information. And I, I, it, it exactly fulfills the um, idea I had about these uh, these presentations that they would serve as, as a fundamental learning material for for people to look at. Uh, Thank so, you very much. So so this is really really great. So <clears throat> I know it's a little bit off topic, but um, I think one of the most important things is that uh, petroleum systems uh, analysts and basin modelers don't always realize how important their work is for diagenesis. And, yeah, yeah, it's a whole other, you know, a lot of times the focus, mm -hmm. not surprising, on organic, the organic matter uh, maturation and, and migration. Mm -hmm. It's super important for digenesis too. Yeah. So as I think about this, uh, you know, these these uh, uncertainties in, in in the basin models, uh, they are pretty significant in in, in the burial histories. Uh, do, do you want to comment somehow on, you know, how, how these uncertainties in, in the burial history, uh, yeah, temperatures and etc., how, how they compare to the you know accuracy of, of, of these diagenetic models and how you know? Yeah, do you want to comment anything about that? Whatever you like. Yeah, actually, that's something that we we thought of a fair amount about, David. One of the things that we've observed is that if you use a, a consistent approach towards basin modeling, both for the places where you optimize your model parameters for the diagenesis models and where you make the predictions, that that results in 
you can have alternative scenarios, like say heat flow scenarios or erosional scenarios. But what you typically find is that then you end up getting pretty similar predictions. So the key is consistency. And this is why we don't believe in, uh, for instance, in a, um, a global correct, say, activation energy for quartz crystal uh, growth. Because, it, because it's highly dependent on the assumptions that are used to derive the temperature histories that you, you might use. All right. So, so, so you, even though you, you may end up with two different burial history scenarios, once you uh, tie it together and calibrate to the uh, sample uh, observations, you, mm -hmm. you, you in the end you will end up with, with decent predictions of, of rock properties. Yeah. Uh, so there's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to, to uh, Lowry's question here. Are the relationships published by Lewis? and Witten, temperature gradient related to proxy loss gradient, still valid at the large scale. Um, that, I'd say, yes, that indeed temperature gradient is important, but it's, it's more complex than just the temperature gradient. It's really also a function of time. If we think about the quartz, quartz growth, let's, let's contrast quartz growth, say, with organic matter maturation, or say, vitronite reflectance. Now, with vitronite, um, once you reach a certain temperature, the vitronite um, very quickly uh, achieves a, um, a stable value. On the other hand, when we're thinking about quartz crystal growth, what we're actually using the temperature for is to describe the rate of quartz crystal growth. So that rate of growth could go on indefinitely at a given temperature if we had no surface area problems. So to first approximation, the quartz growth will be a linear function of time at a given temperature and an exponential function of, of temperature itself. So temperature gradient is really important because it affects the thermal exposure that the rock sees, but to really get an accurate depiction of the overall effect of temperature on diagenesis, we need to think about the, the history of temperature, um, not necessarily just the, the gradient temperature. So I, I'm not sure if that addressed your question, Lowry, but that's my, that's my shot at it. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to contrast that, effective stress is a little bit different. Um, what we find there is that it's not so much the length that we're at a high effective stress, it's actually the absolute uh, effective stress that tends to matter in terms of the magnitude of, of compaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, another question that comes to my mind. So I know um, You've helped to develop uh, some routines that, that link touchstone uh, to basin models such as cauldron in shell, I know Petromod, uh, probably others also. Uh, yeah, which other tools uh, can, can you uh, interact with, uh, with with the touchstone results? I mean, is it in Temis also? Do, do you have ability to work with Temis or? We have a system called T, um, and another system called T Earth, and those models are agnostic with respect to the source of the basin modeling data. So uh, we've used them with Trinity, uh, you know, Temis, Flow, um, sure. Petromod, you know, and, and in-house various in-house systems. They simply uh, require that we have uh, basin modeling results for uh, certain surfaces of interest. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the volume, and then we can import that, and then use that to derive the, the barrel histories. All right. So, so Trinity was actually what, what interested me most. Uh, so, so you, yeah. it is possible to link it with that and and, and apply it on, on Trinity model. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, probably exhausted. Yeah, uh, but you know, I think uh, Stephen Cruz comment at seventeen eleven uh, kind of captures the essence of the silence, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was a little bit scared, you know, giving a giving a diagenesis talk to petroleum systems analyst group that, that's kind of intimidating, you know. Yeah, but uh, I, you know one reason why I wanted you to present this is because it is that I, I feel that this topic is not that routinely, you know, applied in, in PSA practice. 
uh, most of the time when I hear discussions, at least at the PSA group, it's about geochemistry, maybe some burial history, uh, some other things. But, but uh, it, it seems like I, I'm almost the only one who brings up this uh, topic of uh, reservoir properties uh, occasion, occasionally up. So, so I wanted uh, to, to popularize it a little, little more. I appreciate the opportunity to yeah. say something for the cause. Yeah. So, uh, for the people before you leave, in case you haven't written down the counts of people watching together as a group, please do so that I, I get some numbers and, and statistics who is, who is watching. Otherwise, uh, I don't want to extend this for too long. If you have any question, please speak up now or type it. Uh, otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll close the session. And uh, there will be a second session uh, later on, uh, within a few hours. And then, of course, I will uh, set up the uh, archive on YouTube. Uh, I, I think, do I remember correctly you agreed with this or? or, or... Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, David. Thanks again, everyone, for uh, tuning in. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And, right, and so, David, I guess we'll so I will close it now and, and we'll meet again at the uh, time for the session two, okay? Sounds great. Great. Thank you very much and uh, yeah, hope, hope to see uh, all of you again at the next uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you, Rob, again. Um, yeah, and anybody has any questions? You can uh, just speak up or, or you can use the chat window to add it in. Yes, uh, interesting talk. I have a general question out of curiosity. Uh, we talked about the clay detrital grains in the sandstone and how they change the reservoir quality. Just out of curiosity, with the diagenesis of the clay grains, for example, the conversion of smithsite to elite, would that have any significant implication as far as the reservoir quality of the sand goes? Thanks. The smectite elitization reaction? Yes. That have, is that the question of whether that would have an impact on the reservoir? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, um, you know, and I, I'd like to hear what Steve Franks thinks about this. He's, of course, written some of the most important paper, one of the most important papers ever written on spectite elitization. Um, I, I couldn't, but I my couldn't hear it. Oh, go ahead. No, feeling is, you could hear the question, Steve? Yeah, there was some uh, rattling. The question uh, was, uh, with the smectite uh, the question was, uh, as I understand it, was, uh, would the smectite elitization reaction uh, have an impact on reservoir quality in sands. And I guess my view would be that to the first approximation probably wouldn't have that big of an impact because if you had detrital clay in the system, even if it's smectitic to begin with, if that reacts to form illite, it still is a kind of clay that's sitting there. It's just, if it's essentially a replacement reaction where it's uh, just gone from one mineral phase to another mineral phase, you know, a smectitic phase to a more elytic phase, it probably wouldn't have that big of a reaction uh, impact. On the other hand, if that smectite is dissolving away and then you're precipitating out more uh, like hairy eolite into the pores, that could be really important. And certainly when kaolinite reacts um, with K-Phelps part of form eolite, that can drop the current. What do you think, Steve? Well, yeah, I think you nailed it right there. Uh... Rob, when you talked about it, when it when it goes to, and I wasn't sure if the question was about detrital clays or about early smectite grain coatings then going growing to elite. But I think your comment about the fact that if you're going from smectite that's going into solution and reprecipitating as fibrous elite, it could obviously have a very big effect. But I wasn't sure if the question was about the uh, release of silica, which you know we. Uh, am I speaking over someone? I apologize. No, I, I muted uh, Visam. It was coming from him, apparently. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. If, if the question, if the questioner was asking about the smectite re light reaction and the release of silica and all that, like uh, you know, Jim Bowles and I wrote on some years ago, 
Uh, yeah, I think Rob's comment early on about uh, Valderhog coming up with the idea that you know the thing to be concerned about is not the source of silica, but the uh, rate limiting step, which seems to be precipitation. I think that was just a huge breakthrough, and so many of us, I think, spent so much of our time worrying about the source of silica. And I know that at least one of the participants, I heard him say he was a graduate student. I would just like to make the comment that sometimes people talk about asking the wrong questions or, you know, I think for a long time we, uh, many of us asked the wrong question and we focus so much on the source of silica and it turns out that maybe that's not that important at all when it comes to quartz cementation. But uh, yeah, I just, uh, Rob, every time I see what you guys are doing, it uh, it just amazes me the strides that y'all have made and the things that y'all uh, do and, and I love the approach about experiment, theory, and then observation. You know, all three of those things are so important. And I'm quoting someone whose name I think it might have been Preston Cloud who said experiment theory and observation are like finger, thumb, and eye. Without all three, it's very difficult to grasp anything. That's great. So, That's so I just want to compliment you guys. Uh, I just love what you do, and I miss coming to your meetings. <laughs> we miss you too, Steve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions or comments that I could address? I'm looking through the chat log from, from the first session, and Charlotte Holly asked a question at 1715, if you want to read this. Is the plan with Cyberstone to also, hold on, it jumped away from me. Is the plan with Cyberstone to also simulate the growth of all other important phases? Chloride. Yeah. 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 In fact, we're working now on uh, getting chloride coatings uh, into the system and being able to, being able to correctly um, reproduce the effect that the coatings have on the geometry of, of growing quartz. Um, but you know it, we're in such early early stage in development. Although it's, I've been working on this thing for about three years, but even so, it, um, you know we have to get the compaction and quartz cementation right first, or everything else is just window dressing. That's my view. So that's where we started. But we do, certainly do ultimately want to get um, all kinds of other geometrical arrangements of cement. And the other thing, of course, that we have to get um, that we haven't really addressed yet is uh, detrital clay in the system. Mm -hmm. Rob, uh, this is Steve again. If I, I would like to uh, ask a question that if I understand, if I remember correctly, the predictions that you are making for a prosty is you're predicting thin section prosty. Is that correct? Well, we predict, Steve, we predict um, the, we through compaction and cementation, we derive the intergranular porosity. Right. And then uh, we, some of our models are predicting grain dissolution porosity. Um, and then we can also, you know, use that kind of uh, paragenesis type approach towards, you know, uh, essentially defining some secondary porosity that, that would form. And then finally, um, we also try to uh, predict the amount of microporosity by looking at the volume abundance of microporous components in the rock, like say detrital clay, right. and, and then assigning a microporosity to the, each of those components. So, so we do kind of a, we have an explicit intergranular, secondary, and then microporosity. And and then is that how you then relate it back to helium porosity to try to compare it with with a measured permeability and log porosity and yeah. so on? Our ben our benchmark. Um, which, you know, there's always some problems with this, but we're, when we're trying to match the microporosity, um, we are essentially taking the difference between the, the core plug helium porosity and the, the thin section macro porosity, which would be the right. same as the and, the and the secondary porosity. So we're assuming that, that di the difference there is the micro porosity. Right, the right. Yeah. You know, which, you know, it's always can be a little problematic in some cases because the core plug is, you know, usually a different volume than the thin section and so forth, but that's that's the approach that we use. 
Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I like that idea, that approach, and you know that this whole question of microprosty is, is a very interesting one, I think, because people define it so differently. If you look in the literature, but I think most, well, I think a lot of us petrographers define it just as you did, and it's basically the difference between thin section prosty and helium prosty or core prosty. Yeah, I, I guess sort of the formal. Uh, Definition is something like you know 15 micron diameter pores or smaller you know with yeah. something that you really can't clearly resolve in a in a thin section you know by optical methods. Yeah, and could you say anything about the difficulty of going from say your predicted prosty to uh, core measured prosty and then again the step up to log prosty? Do you get very involved in that aspect of it? Well, we we are our comfort zone is definitely the core plug because that's yeah. what we can get data from and, and clearly measure. But obviously, the real world uh, typically revolves around logs. Um, so we we essentially are in the same position that uh, any petrophysicist would be in when you're looking at core plug data and, and then looking at log data. Right. You know how do you, how do you go from between the two? Uh, and to be honest, we we generally don't really cross that divide too much. We, we try to pre work with petrophysicists um, that are more familiar with that jump than we are and, and hope that we can we can at least help them. Um, right. But uh, yeah, I don't know, I, I guess I dodged that question, didn't I? Well, no, I think I think we all dodged that question. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy one. Okay, I have one more practical question. Um, practical from a point of view of applying this uh, for clients is um, how can one get hold of these uh, tools, the Touchstone and and uh, the, these other tools you mentioned earlier for transferring the Touchstone results into different um, basic modeling packages. Uh, it, does one have to be a member of the consortium, or, or is it possible to buy these things uh, ad hoc for, for a project, or, or uh, some well, sort of uh, Currently, uh, we don't provide them for commercial use outside of the consortium members, um, and that's, I guess, kind of a selfish thing in a way because uh, we don't, you know, we we are so dependent on these companies for supporting our research and development that. Uh, uh, we, you know, we, we try to keep them as happy as we possibly can, and so, um, mm -hmm. so unfortunately, mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't provide them for commercial use outside. We are providing free licenses to Touchstone to a number of universities. Okay. Um, okay. That can use them for their for public domain research, and so mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of universities in in Europe and in the U.S. that uh, we provide a free license licenses to. Although we have a because we're a microscopic company, um, mm -hmm. we have a limited ability to, to, you know, we want to make sure that when people use our stuff that they have a pretty thorough understanding of how it works and that we vet the work. So we do have a finite capacity to help students. Um, mm -hmm. We can use mm -hmm. about a half dozen and that's about as many as we can probably handle. But if if there is someone sitting uh, or someone is listening to to this talk from some companies that are outside of, of the consortium, uh, and and they would like to apply this in in their exploration, what what their options would be? Uh, so I imagine partnering maybe with with some of these members of the um, of the consortium we, uh, or joining or we. Uh... We do consulting projects for companies that are not in our consortium. So uh -huh. okay. We we can do we do in fact we work with a lot of companies that are not in our consortium. Um, okay. okay. Many of whom um, just don't necessarily have the in-house expertise to get somebody up to speed, you know, with this type of thing and they just mm -hmm. rather, you know, work with us. Um, and some that might be interested but they want to do some projects first to get a sense of whether it's going to be useful to them. Okay, okay. All right.
So unless there are some, any more questions, uh, I think we could uh, conclude this, uh, this session. Uh, maybe I would ask uh, Steve Franks to uh, stay for a moment, a little longer. Uh, and uh, for everybody else, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, stay in tune for the uh, recordings on YouTube and then the following presentations later on. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks, David.